Good morning. How are we this morning? Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. So how is it up in New York? Is it cold still? Very cold. Very cold, it's a lot of snow freezing. still or it's melting? Melting. Uh, Don't feel too bad. We are cool in Florida also. It's not the same cold. <laughs> no, it's going to warm up to like 66, but this morning was like 30 something degrees. Oh, wow. Any questions from our last class? Mm -mm. Good morning, Professor. It's about the lab. Where we can find the lab the, to do the homework? The lab, you have to purchase that. And I, instruction is loaded on the site on how to purchase that. So along with the textbook, you have to purchase the lab. You could purchase a, a, a package of the textbook and the lab together. You could purchase an online version of the textbook with the lab. You could purchase a hard copy version. They are all different combination, but you'll get that either from Pearson or you could get that on any bookstore. But the lab, you should order from Pearson because anything to do with the lab, they could help you out. Thank you. There's an, instru an instruction sheet on the starting start here menu. Let's print that out and follow it through. Okay, thank you, Professor. Any other questions before we start? Well, the last thing I just give an introduction of what the course is gonna be. Um, we're gonna have lectures every Thursday, unless the Thursday happens to be a holiday. So every Thursday, I'm gonna lecture on a chapter. If we have exam that week, we, have, we will have not have any lecture. You're gonna be studying for your exam. So, so this is how we're gonna run the course for the next 15 weeks. Thursday, I'm gonna lecture on the chapter. Tuesday, for the first probably four weeks, I'm gonna come on. If anybody have questions, we'll have a discussion. If you, when you guys are comfortable with that, we may just have the lectures on Thursday. If you still need us to meet on Tuesday and have discussions, we will, but you have to prepare to have discussions. You have to prepare your questions and I will address them, okay? But Thursday will be the main day where I will we'll lecture on, every Thursday I'll lecture on one chapter. So today I'm gonna to lecture on chapter one. Chapter one is a pretty short chapter. Expect my lecture to run about um, maybe an hour to an hour, 15 or 30 minutes. And then if you have questions um, after the lecture, we could uh, go ahead and discuss them. While I'm lecturing, if you have questions, um, when I come to a stopping point, please feel free to ask your questions, okay? But I'll try to complete my point first before I entertain your question. Um, I don't mute anybody, Mike, so you could have a discussion um, if you have background noise or you have your kids playing or brother playing or someone making noise, then you could mute your mic. And when you need to ask a question, you could unmute and chat with me. But when you come in the class, you're automatically joined. Your mic is on, should be on and ready for discussion if you want to. If you want, you could mute your mic while I'm talking and then unmute it when you're ready to ask a question or involve in any discussion. But on Thursdays, um, what to expect every Thursday, mainly I'm lecturing on a chapter. So this week will be chapter one, next week will be chapter two, the following week will be chapter three, and then chapter 25. I'll basically follow the outline in chronological order. I do not jump around a lot of times. Um, I'll follow the outline to the T, but I'm lecturing for the chapter. If you open your textbook, you could basically follow me through. I may move things in a little different order sometimes, but you could follow me through the, the topics I'm going through. When I lecture, I'm gonna go to the course uh, under weekly assignment tab. There's a PowerPoint outline of every chapter and I'm gonna follow that outline through so that you could follow my lecture as I'm going through. 
Okay. I have to remember to mute my phone so nobody calls me when I'm with you guys, because you guys are extremely important. Okay, so the last time we introduced auditing, and I told you all that every one of you did audit before, you never think about it as auditing. Uh, you are our accounting major. You're required to do this course as part of your curriculum. You're required to do it for the CPA exam. For those of you who are aspiring to be CPAs, auditing is one part of the CPA exam. And this is probably the only course most of you are gonna take in preparation for that part of the CPA exam. So this is an extremely important course for those who are practicing, who are planning to become CPAs. I got two nephews who are CPAs. And um, last night I was talking to one of them and he was telling me about his experience. He was working with KPMG. He now went to another big firm at one of the top 15. And we were chatting about his experience and he is doing auditing and he's enjoying it. He was my student at York, by the way. I have another nephew who graduated from Baruch and um, he went out to work for RSM McGladbury. And now he's in working with some hedge fund organization and he's doing pretty well. My only son, he's out in Colorado. He just finished his bachelor's in accounting and he's planning to go for his CPA exam. So I came from a family, I'm a family of accountants and teachers. I got three sisters, two of them are teachers. One is working in education at York in computer programming. My wife was a teacher. She retired now and she's running the family business. My father was a teacher. So this is our life, teaching. Uh, we feel that teaching, we are giving back to the community, to the people, to our people. Now, why am I in Florida and I'm teaching at York College in New York? Well, I think this semester I'm finishing my 30th year at York College. 17 of those years I've been commuting from Florida to New York. Before we were online, I was commuting from Florida to New York to teach. New York is a special place for me. I graduated from York. My wife graduated from York. I got two sisters who graduated from York. I got a bunch of nieces and nephews who graduated from either York or one of the other CUNY colleges. So we are all CUNY in the family. It's a special place because CUNY gives to me. This is my way of giving back to CUNY. So I have no intentions of teaching in Florida because uh, I don't see it as my community where I grew up. I see York as my community. I'm from Guyana. I left Guyana at the age of 18 and moved to New York. And for 23 years, I was in New York and then moved to, to Florida about 17, 18 years ago. So that's my lifestyle. In addition to being a professor, I'm also a practitioner. I was an SEC consultant for 12 years. I lectured for the State Society for a number of years. So I did a lot of professional work. Oh dear, I was considered one of the top 10 SEC specialists in New York back in the 90s. I gave that up when I moved to Florida about 18 years ago and um, just stick to my teaching. Now, Auditing, besides financial statement audit, which we're gonna talk about mostly in this course, auditing encompasses a broad array of entity and areas. And as I said last Tuesday, we are doing auditing every single day of our life. A family member tell you something. They make a representation to you. You come home, your father was late from work. Dad, how can you come home late? Tell you why he was late. Well, you 
evaluate the credibility of what they're telling you. Right? If your father always been truthful or honest to you, you will take it on its face value. On the other hand, if they were not truthful and they were not honest, you will try to check and see if that's what they're doing. Your father, it could be your boyfriend, it could be your wife, your husband, your younger sibling, but you try to verify the credibility of a representation. And that's what auditing is. We are verifying the credibility of a representation. So something you'll see audit that are non-financial statement audit. They're hiring people to audit in hotels, right? Various areas of auditing. We are gonna be professionals. We are gonna, we are being trained to do financial statement audit. And we're going to be auditing the accounting information. Now, since auditing is a separate field from accounting, it is an art, more of an art than a science. Why do we hire accountants to be auditor? Well, think about this. The financial statement. The rules of preparing financial statements are generally accepted accounting principles. Right? Those are the rules we use to prepare financial statements. If we want to check and see if the financial statements are prepared in accordance with the rule, the person who we hire to check have to know what the rules are. And who know what the rules are? Accountants. Accountants you train in your four years at New York, you take accounting 101, 102, 201, 202, 203, 301. All those are financial accounting that deals with GAP, yeah, how to prepare financial statement. So by the time you finish all those accounting courses and then you move to auditing, in auditing, you're gonna learn how to check to see if these financial statements are prepared in accordance with GAP. Yeah. And that's what the gist of this course is going to be. So what is auditing from a financial statement perspective? Now, let me share my screen with you and let me go into your course. Um, and now let me go into Blackboard, and on Blackboard on the chapter, weekly assignment for chapter one, we got the instructions as to read the chapter one in the text, follow the chapter outline while looking at the YouTube video. Well, instead of looking at the YouTube video, you're looking at my live lecture. And after my lecture, you should do the homework problem assigned on the course. You should do the practice assignment on my accounting lab for chapter one. Now, I recommend you don't do the, chap the accounting lab right away. Um, finish chapter one and two when you're comfortable and you get to chapter three, then you can start doing my accounting lab. I haven't opened the assignment yet on my accounting lab. So I'm going to open the chapter outline, which is here. I may have it open up here. Let's see. No, I don't. So I'm going to open the outline for chapter one. And chapter one, the demand for audit and other assurance services. Now, what are we gonna learn in chapter one? We're gonna describe auditing. We're gonna talk about what auditing is. I'll go to your text and read you what the description is. We'll distinguish between auditing and accounting. I kind of touch on that a little, how they are different. We're gonna go more in depth into it. We'll explain the importance of auditing in reducing information risk. We'll talk about information risk. What is information risk? How auditing plays a part in reducing that risk. We'll list the cause of information risk and explain how this risk can be reduced. may have gone too far. 
We've described assurance services that distinguish audit services from other assurance and non-assurance services provided by CPA. We're going to talk what is assur about what is assurance services and how auditing fits into the assurance services. We'll differentiate the three main types of audits. We'll identify the primary types of auditors that do these audits. And lastly, we'll describe the requirements for becoming a CPA, which most of you aspire to be. So, describe auditing. If you open your text and you turn to page four, Page four gives you a definition of auditing, nature of auditing, and gives you a definition that is highlighted. Auditing is the accumulation and evaluation of evidence about information to determine and report on the degree of correspondence between the information and the established criteria. Auditing should be done by a competent, independent person. So the correspondence between the information and the representation. The representation, your boyfriend or husband comes in late from work. You ask them where they were, they said they were at work. That's the representation. You're gonna accumulate and evaluate evidence to determine if that representation is true or not. Unfortunately, in this situation, you are not an independent person. So you may come out with the wrong conclusion. For you to come up with the right conclusion, you have to be independent. What does do we mean by independent? Independent, you mean that you are unbiased. In chapter two, we'll talk a little more about independent. So here's our description of auditing. It's the accumulation and evaluation of evidence. Accumulation, putting together. Once you finish putting together or assembling the information, the next thing you'll do, you will evaluate. Evaluation of evidence, what is evidence? We all heard this term evidence. If there's a court case, we present the evidence. What is evidence? Evidence is information that you use to corroborate the criteria. In this case, the criteria, in our case, the criteria will be a financial statement. In the situation where your boyfriend or husband come home late, the criteria will be that they were at work. So we'll gather information which will be evidence because we will use the information to determine and report on the degree of correspondence between the information and the established criteria. If the information you gather shows that your boyfriend was at work or your husband was at work, or does it show that they were out at the bar having a drink? Or does it show that they were having a good time with some other girl, right? If they're at work, they're fine. Other than that, they'll be dead. Right? Auditing should be done by a competent independent person. In financial statement auditing, the competent independent person is a CPA. Why are they competent? They are competent because they have education and experience in auditing. They have education, training, and experience in auditing. They are independent because they are not financially connected to the client. They are not connected to the client in any way, shape, or form, except through that audit for the most part. They are considered unbiased. Any questions so far? We're doing good? Now, I'm aware that some of you could, you know, just turn on your screen and put your picture there and be doing something else than that there. And that's fine because I'm not the one losing. You're the one losing by, for doing that. So you don't need to do that because I don't take attendance on the screen. If you're on the screen or not, I take attendance on visiting the website. Okay. Do you visit the website? Did you, are you doing your homework on a timely basis? That's my attendance.
And I know who is there or not and who is following me because based on the questions that are being asked. Information and established criteria. To do an audit, not only should we have information, but we should have the information in a verifiable form. We should be able to verify the information. Let's go back to the situation. Your boyfriend or girlfriend come home late from work, come home late. You ask them where they've been. They said they've been to work. What are some of the things you're gonna to use to determine if they were at work? One, if they keep doing that, you might call the work after five and see if they're there. You may call the job after five and see if they're there. Two, and I know ladies are good at this, you set up a tracking on their cell phone so you know where they're at. Ladies, any of you track your boyfriend? My wife used to track me on my cell phone. So what I did every day, I leave it at the hotel for two hours and pick it up later. The guy was confused. He wanted to know, why are you leaving your cell phone at the hotel for two hours? He said, no, do me a favor, just keep the cell phone. So she's tracking me at the hotel every day for two hours <laughs> until she stopped tracking me. So the information must be verifiable. You, you must be able to verify that the information is correct or not correct. You may take your, your boyfriend or girlfriend's cell phone, see what they were doing after work, after hours. If they were talking to someone, who were they talking to? Were they clients or were they friends, right? So you guys know how you gather that evidence. Likewise, when we're doing financial statement, we're gathering evidence, but a different sort of evidence. Evidence that support whether the financial statements are prepared in accordance with GAAP or not. And the criteria must be clear. In, in the case of financial statement, it's clear. The criteria, is it GAAP or not? In the case of your boyfriend or girlfriend, were they at work or not, right? What are the criteria? FASB, for us, a financial statement audit, or IASB. FASB is GAAP, IASB International Accounting Standard Board. Evidence, what is evidence? Evidence is any information used by the auditor to determine with whether the information being audited is stated in accordance with the criteria. So any information that you use to support that the financial statement are prepared in accordance with GAAP becomes evidence. Chapter seven, we'll talk about evidence and we'll talk about the type of evidence. They give you some example, transaction data, client testimony, written and electronic communication with outsider, observation, observation of the client business and what they're doing. Competent independent person. You must be competent, you must be independent, you must have judgment and experience for you to evaluate the evidence and come to a proper conclusion. Now, at the end of the audit, you will issue an audit report. In chapter three, we are gonna talk about the audit report. The audit report is basically, basically a one page document. For this chapter, just read the report. You don't have to know it. In chapter three, we'll talk about it in detail. We'll talk about each of the paragraphs. We'll talk about when you issue what, okay? They give you an example in your textbook of the audit of a tax return. Anybody ever get audited by the IRS or your parents ever get audited by the IRS? Go on. You have? Yes. Any of you guys scared of the IRS? Any what? Any of you guys are scared of the IRS? Yes. <laughs> Most people, most people are scared of the IRS. They get a notice from the IRS, they go nuts. 
Years ago when I was in New York, I was a controller for a company and the attorney for the company got a notice from the IRS on his personal tax return. His office is one floor above my office. He must have made a half a dozen trips to my office looking for me. I generally show up to work 9.15, 9.30. From nine o'clock to 9, 9.30 when I get there, he made a half a dozen trips. Got there, you're going, Bo, Bo, you gotta help me. I'm in big trouble. I said, what trouble are you in? I thought somebody wants to kill him. The IRS sent him a letter. I had to calm him down. I said, don't worry about this. Let me look at it. I'll take care of it for you. This guy's an attorney, right? So imagine an everyday person receiving a letter from the IRS. They got scared. They don't sleep sometimes. Right? You as the practitioner need to get, part of it is to handle the situation and, and respond to the letter. But another part of it is to deal with the personal responsibility of calming that person down bring them back to normal and assure them that, hey, it's nothing to worry about. Okay. I talk to the IRS every day. I like meeting with IRS agents. I do a lot of audits for my client. I represent them for IRS audits, right? As an accountant, you should not scare of the IRS. You should not scare of the IRS. So they send a notice to me, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it, okay? Then you call them back and tell them what the notice is about and how you're going to address it. And then you go on to address the notice with the IRS. And an and IRS notice could just be, sometimes it's, they tell the client, we're sending you a refund. Professor, yeah. that happened to me. I received a letter. Like it took me a few weeks before I opened it. And when I opened it, it was actually a check. <laughs> <laughs> you see? So, so sometimes it's not all bad news. Sometimes it's good news. So sometimes you could get a refund. Sometimes you just have an inquiry on your tax return. Occasionally, they're doing an audit. And sometimes they're doing a detailed audit. We, we as accountants should not be scared of IRS audits. That's part of our job. You know. uh, going back Back in my career, I used to go into the IRS office once a month. I get a client gets an audit, I go in there and I discuss with the IRS and represent them and fight my client position. That's what we are paid for. We are professionals. Should not be afraid of the IRS. So what does the IRS do? The competent independent person is the internal revenue agent. They accumulate and evaluate evidence, which is the examine gases check and other supporting records to see what they're trying to see. They're trying to see if your federal tax return is prepared in accordance with the Internal Revenue Code, in accordance with the tax laws. And at the end, they will issue a report, which is that letter. And if everything is fine, they would not do anything. If something is not, or they have a question on something, they will send you a letter. It may be a letter of inquiry, it may be a letter that you're auditing. It may be a letter that you're changing stuff on your tax return, right? It will be a letter of proposed changes. Every year I go through about a dozen proposed changes that I address, right? Right now for one of my doctor clients, um, he got a proposed change on his 2018 tax return. And I know the proposed change is wrong, so I have to address it. So I'm waiting on him to get me the information so that I could do that. So this is one type of audit. One type of audit is IRS agent or New York State agent auditing the tax return to see that they are prepared in accordance with the tax rules and regulation. Those auditors are called IRS auditors. Distinguish between auditing and accounting. So we talk what, about what auditing is. What is accounting and how is accounting is different from auditing? Accounting is the recording, classifying, summarizing, and accumulated evidence to prepare the financial statement. So accounting dealt with the preparation of the financial statement. Auditing deals with 
reviewing that financial statement to see that it follows the rules, which is GAAP. So in a financial statement audit, we are looking to see if the financial statement followed the rules of GAAP. In an IRS audit, we are looking to see if the tax return followed the rules of the Internal Revenue Code. So accounting is a recording, classifying, and summarizing of economic event for the purpose of providing financial information used in decision making. Auditing is determining whether recorded information properly record, reflects the economic event, the event that occurred during the accounting period. Did this financial statement reflect in accordance with GAAP what happened at the organization? That's what auditing is, put in another way. Any questions on accounting or auditing? Next topic, the importance of auditing in reducing information risk. What is information risk? And how do we deal with it? Information risk is the risk that the information we're looking at is not what actually happened. It is the likelihood that the information we're looking at is not what have actually happened. Why we have information risk? Well, for various reasons. We got owners that are not part of the management of the organization. We have absentee owner. So the manager of the organization have different objective from the owner. The owner want to show, wants to maximize profit. The manager wants to show they do a good job. So they may be then to mistake the financial statement. So we need the auditor to come and see, look at the financial statement to determine if it's people in accordance with GAAP. So the demand driver for auditing is information risk. Auditing can have a significant effect on information risk. Now let's see what and how. The causes of information risk and explaining how this risk can be reduced. What causes information risk? Remoteness of information. Biasness and motive of the provider. The provider is management. They're biased. They want to show that they're doing a good job. Voluminous data, a lot of data. Chances for errors will be greater. Complex exchange transaction, the more complex the chat transaction, the chances for mistake will be greater. How do we reduce the information risk? The user verifies the information, the user shared the information risk with management, and we have audited financial statement. We have an external party that is independent, that is knowledgeable of GAP, looking at these financial statements to determine that they are prepared in accordance with the rules of preparing financial statement. The rules of preparing financial statement are generally accepted accounting principles. Relationship among auditor, client, and external users. The client hires the auditor to audit the financial statement. And those financial statements are provided to shareholders, banks, and creditors. To give them assurance that the financial statement reflects what actually happened at the entity. Those investors, shareholders, creditors, will either invest money in the organization or lend money to the organization. Describe assurance services and distinguish audit services from other assurance and non-assurance services. Assurance services. Assurance services are independent professional services, can be performed by CPA or by a variety of other professionals. Financial statement audit can only be performed by a 
CPA. Some assurance services can be performed by other professionals, but not financial statement audit, okay? Uh, professor, can you give me like other like professional one like what who, who are they can uh, on the assurance service? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that for me, please? So, uh, can you go back to the previous uh, slides? Okay, for me? sure. Yeah. So yeah, from here it's just like uh, assurance service, just like by a variety of other professionals. So who are those uh, professionals like? Can you? We'll talk about it. We'll talk about that shortly. Okay, sure, thanks. We, we touched on some of them. Um, the IRS will examine your tax return. New York State Department of Taxation will examine your state tax return, right? So assurance services are a type of assurance services. The CPA report on the reliability of an assertion that is made by another party. Let's, let's uh, analyze this a little. The CPA reports on the reliability of the assertion. What is the assertion? You go to the client, the client gives you a financial statement. By giving you that financial statement, there are various assertions that are being made. The financial statement lists assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. The client is asserting that those assets that are listed on the financial statement are owned by the company, are properly valued, and we'll spend the whole chapter talking about this. Right? Those liabilities are recorded at the correct amount and are liabilities of the company and not some other party. Yes, the assertions are made by another party. Who is the other party? The client management of the organization that we are auditing. Attestation services. Attestation services are part of assurance services. Most attestation services have to be performed by a CPA. The biggest portion of attestation services are audits of historical financial statement and reviews of historical financial statement. Other attestation services are internal control over financial reporting and information technology. Basically, almost all of this has to be performed by a CPA. You have to be a CPA to do an audit. You have to be a CPA to do a review. You have to be a CPA to do to do an audit of internal control. We'll talk about that in chapter three also. And certain information technology information, you have to be a CPA to audit. Okay. Now, how is attestation services different from assurance services that we talked about before? So audits are part of attestation services. But how is attestation services different from assurance services? All attestation services are assurance services. However, there are some assurance services that are not attestation services. Now, most of you, when you apply for a job at a CPA firm, especially a larger CPA firm, you'll be applying to the business assurance department if you want to do audits. Years ago, it used to be called the audit department. Now it's called the business assurance department because it encompasses more than audits of financial statement. One of my latest screen, I'll tell you what the other things are. I'll have a diagram that put this in context with assurance services. Web trust and site trust services. What are web trust and what are site trust services? Web trust, you're looking at a company website to see that it conformed to certain criteria for website design. Let me go back to my screen. Site trust you're looking at the, the client information system processing to see that this meets certain criteria and certain 
checks and balances. We'll talk more about them in chapter 23. 25, sorry, not 23. Other assurance services. Most of the other assurance services that CPA provide do not meet formal definition of attestation services. The CPA is not required to issue a written report. The assurance does not have to be about the reliability of another party assertion about the client compliance with specific criteria. Talks about the green initiative. We are not gonna spend time on that, but we, I wanna go to the other assurance sources example. Assessing risk of accumulating distribution and storage of digital information, assessing security risk and related controls. These are big things these days. Security risk. Any of you ever travel at the airport recently? After 9-11, there was a big security risk. So when you travel at the airport now, you have to go through certain procedure. You have to go through a scanner, you have to take out your shoes, you have to take out your coat, they scan your bags, etc. Now with COVID-19 coming into play, anybody travel recently? If you yeah. travel recently in the airplane, you must have a mask on throughout the flight. Some airline you will sit in alternate seats. They keep the middle row vacant. I think Delta does that. But a low flight carrier like the Spirit, the plane is full, but they want you to keep your mask on. They encourage you to wash your hands, right? All these are security risks because if you don't and you get COVID-19, what could happen? You could die, right? Other assurance services example, controls over and risk related to investment, compliance with entertainment royalty agreement, Think of this, um, Super Bowl is this weekend. Anybody watching Super Bowl? The Tampa Bay Bucks are competing. So Tom Brady, the reigning quarterback, he have all these agreements with companies that he promotes. Their goods and services. And he get a royalty agreement with them. Sometimes he may hire you as the auditor to audit to see if he's getting his fair share of royalty. ISO 9000 certification, we'll talk about that later. Corporate responsibility and sustainability. So this diagram is not in your text. This diagram is in an older edition that I borrowed because I like it very much. This diagram clearly point out what are the assurance services, what are the non-assurance services, and how does attestation services fit in to assurance services? So we talk about the attestation services, accounting review, internal control, and other attestation services. There are some services that deal with management consulting or other assurance services that come under assurance services but are not attestation. Right? There's no established criteria. For example, Tom Brady wants to know his fair share of royalties. Right? Justin Bieber wants to know if he's getting his cor correct recorded royalty from the records he produced. Right? Those that are fit into attestation services, but they are assurance services. Anybody drive a car? You guys are there? Yes. You drive a car, you go to the pump. Whenever you go to pump gas, look at the pump. You'll see there's a seal there that tells you that the pump was inspected. So when you buy 20, 20 gallons of gas, it actually will pump 20 gallons of gas. There are other non-assurance services that are provided by CPA. There are other management consulting, accounting and bookkeeping, and tax services. <coughs> so this is an important diagram. It's not in your textbook, it's, but it's here on the website on the course website. Differentiate the three main types of audit. Well, we talk about IRS audits, right? <clears throat> IRS audit is a form of compliance audit. IRS, New York State Department of Taxation are compliance audits. They're checking to see that you comply with the tax laws in preparing your tax return. 
the other compliance audit. Any given here by the GAO, the General Accounting Office? The General Accounting Office is an arm of the federal government that audit all government contracts. So when you're looking for a job, in addition to the IRS, the GAO is not a bad place to get a job also. So they also involve in compliance audit. Operational audit, what are operational audit? And if you took accounting 260 or 261, those are operational audit. Those courts deal with operational audit or what we call internal audits. See, in an operational audit, you're looking to see that the organization is functioning efficiently and effectively. And then financial statement audit, which is we are auditing the financial statement to see that it is prepared in accordance with GAAP, which we're gonna deal with mainly in this course. After chapter two, we're probably gonna be talking all about financial statement audit. And to give you several examples of each, I'm not gonna go through each of them, but let me go to the types of auditor. The primary types of auditor. We have certified public accounting firms, which are the one that does attestation and financial statement audit. We have the general accounting office auditors, which I mentioned earlier, and they are responsible for auditing all government contracts. We have internal revenue agent, which could be CPA or non-CPA that will audit tax returns. And we have internal auditors, which could be CPA or non-CPA also that look at the organization operation to see if it's effective and efficient. The requirements for becoming a CPA. Any questions so far? There are three requirements for becoming a CPA. There's the education requirement. There's a uniform CPA exam requirement and there's an experience requirement. And the requirements are governed by every state. The only thing that is common to all states is the uniform CPA exam. Regardless of what state you're in, what country you're from, if you want to become a CPA in the United States, you have to pass the uniform CPA examination. If you pass it in one state, it's considered passed in all the states. So you only need to pass that once. You don't have to pass it again if you move from one state to the other. The education requirements. The education requirements vary among states. In New York, you need 120 credits or a bachelor degree so that you could sit for the exam, but you need a total of 150 credit to become a CPA. Many, many of you who are thinking of becoming a CPA, I, occasionally I come across students that want to do their 150 credit at your college. I'm not in favor of that. Think of this. If you want to become a CPA and you need to do 150 credits, you do 120 credits at the undergraduate level. And you go to a graduate school and you do 33 credits and you got a bachelor's and you get a master's degree. Whether you pass or do not pass the CPA exam, you become more marketable. If you do 150 credits at your college or at any school undergraduate level, you still have a bachelor of science degree. However, if you do the Bachelor of Science and then go do your master's, you get an advanced degree that is very portable. And regardless of where you go in the world, that degree carry weight. You could sit for the CPA exam after your bachelor's or after your master's. 
experience requirements. I think in New York, if you have a master's degree, you need one year. I'm not sure if you have a bachelor, I think you may need two years of experience. <clears throat> I'm not, that's, but if you move from New York, another reason why you should do, if you're gonna be a CP, you should do your master's. If you move from New York to a state like Florida, or half of the states of the United States, you need a master's degree. So if you move from New York, your CP in New York, but you did the 150 credit at the undergraduate, and you move to Florida, guess what? You have to go to a master's degree or you're not gonna become a CPA. My son who's in Colorado, they have similar laws like New York. They need 120 credit to sit for the exam. And 150 credit to be a CPA could be at the undergraduate. I told him, I said, son, go do your master's degree. Okay, I'm advising you the same way I'm advising my child. If you plan to be a CPA, do your bachelor's and go do your master's. Not only that, when you do your master's degree, you will attain some advanced areas of specialization that you could specialize in. When I did my master's degree, I did my master's degree at Brooklyn College. I did one course in SEC accounting. From the knowledge I obtained from that one course, I spent 12 years doing consulting to CPA firms on SEC engagements. I was considered a specialist. So if you want to have this as your career, it's important to do some advanced degree. Right? Don't just stop at the bachelor's if you want to be a CPA. Plan on doing the master's. Okay. Uh, and can I ask you something? Oh, yeah. Uh, like, I don't know. I've spoken to some people. I don't know. One of my friends, they're like a lot older, but they believe they got their, I, I don't think they're a CPA, but they got like their bachelor's in accounting, but then they did their master's in something else. For the CPA, we, we, we'd we have to probably do the master's in accounting or like if no, we did a master's ma in business. You can do the master's in something else. But as long as we get the other. Right. But the problem that your friend is going to face, if he moves to a state like Florida, <clears throat> he may have to do some additional education because he will basically have to complete a master's in Florida. Let's say you have a master's in information system. Mm -hmm. You don't have all the accounting courses that states like Florida will require. Right. So you're going to have to do an advanced auditing. You're going to have to do some financial statement courses and a, maybe a tax course. That actually is what he what he has. I believe he has an information. He's like a much older. He's like much older. He's um, right. So nothing wrong so. with that. That's fine. But do a master's because he may have to do another ten, another nine or twelve credits to meet the Florida requirements. That's right. all. Yeah. If you take his okay. appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. So you can do a master's in something else. Nothing wrong with that. Right. Thanks. I did my master's in accounting. I did my master's in accounting out of default. In 1988, I was planning to move to Florida, and I was a CPA in New York. When I explored Florida, I was building a, a home here. Actually, 1987, I started building my home. But as I explored Florida, I re realized that you need a master's degree. So I enrolled in Brooklyn College and do my master's. After I finished my master's, I decided not to move to Florida yet. Why? because that master's degree opened up a whole array of career opportunities for me. I mean, in, at that time with my master's degree, I was like hot cake. <laughs> I start teaching at your college as an adjunct. That was in 1991. In the fall of that year, in the fall of 92, there were two openings, one at York and one at Lima. They applied for both and they accepted me. In addition to teaching, I was doing consulting in Wall Street, all out of my master's degree. I mean, when, when the economy was done, I was doing pretty well. I started my practice. Now you can start a practice without a master's degree, but a specialized practice, you're probably gonna need some advanced education. And this is why, this is why I'm encouraging you, if you're gonna be a CPA, go that direction. My nephews that are CPAs, they went that direction. One of my nephews that um, went to Baruch, RSM gave him an offer. 
while he was a junior, Iris had given him an offer that upon completing your master's degree, you're going to start off with 60000 This is about probably eight years ago. Now that would have been much higher, right? And upon completing his master's, he got a full-time job with RSM. Yeah. You want to position yourself. You're young, take your education, position yourself that you're going to be set for life. You know, when, when I was um, going through my education and so on, that was the main thing in my life. My education, my wife was my girlfriend. And I got married right after I finished my bachelor's. I continue my education. After I graduate and I got my master's and I start teaching and I was doing consulting, my friends were saying that you got it made. And I was saying, no, I didn't get it made. I made it, which is a difference, right? Got it made, somebody give it to you. Nobody give it to me. I went out and earned it. Just like most of you guys coming from a foreign country with parents that doesn't have a lot of financial resources, enrolling in New York College, graduating, and move on in life and move up. Now, in the days that we went into professional accounting, the landscape was a whole lot different coming up as a minority accountant. Right? Now, now there's a lot more opportunities. But yes, we didn't use that as an excuse. Not only me, but a lot of people like me, we braved it, we made it. And then we could have life where, you know, like I'm living now, I could fly from Florida to New York and teach and come back, right? You make your life what you want it to be, okay? Rather than have life dictate who you should be. I see what I want to be and I model myself and get whatever are the necessary, the basic ingredients to be an accountant. I used to hate school. When I was a kid, I hate school. When I was in high school, I hated school. Never liked to read and write. Until now, I don't like to read and write. If you were to tell me that reading and writing would be such a big part of your career, I would say you're nuts. Guess what? I'm a professor. That's what I do. I'm a professor and a professional accountant. That's what I do. I read and write all the time. Yeah. But it gives me a very wonderful life. So likewise, you have to see what your life is going to be, what you want your life to be, and you model what you have to get. For any area you want to go in, there certain prerequisites. Get the prerequisites now while you're young. So by the time you are like 28, 27, before you're 30, you're set. Right? And you got a lot of life from 30 to uh, the life expectancy somewhere near 70 or 80. You got 15 years to enjoy what you worked so hard for. Hopefully you live so long and longer. CPA exam sections. One section in auditing. 25% of the CPA exam is based on this one course that most of you are going to take. So this is a very important course. Just don't come and put your face on the screen and go do something else. Okay, I'm not losing. You're the one losing if you do that. Especially if you're planning to become a CPA. Okay. Pay attention. I will lecture on every single chapter, the same way I'm lecturing on chapter one and I'm going through every single item that, that is of importance. The same way I will lecture on every one of the chapters that we cover. And if you, you stay with me, you follow me, you focus, you're going to be prepared for this exam. After you graduate, you take a review course and you're ready for this exam. Okay. Financial accounting and reporting. All the financial accounting you take, 101, 102, 201, 202, 203, 301. Those six financial accounting courses, one section. So that tells you how important this one course that you're taking in relation to the other financial courses. Business environment and concept, all the business courses you took, one section. Each of these is about five or six courses. This one is only one course. Auditing is only one course. Regulation, what you take in business law and taxation, one course. Your four courses roll up into one section here. So the only section that is basically one course is the auditing section. So this course is extremely important. 
You're not fooling me if you just put your face on there and you go and do something else. You're fooling yourself. You're not preparing yourself for success. Okay? You want to maximize your opportunity, you want to prepare yourself for success. Okay? So there are four parts of the CPA exam. When we took it, we took basically all four parts at the same time. You could take one part at a time. I think you have an 18 month period to complete all four parts. Any questions? Yes, I have a question, Professor. <laughs> yes, um, how, like how often do you have to renew it and what's the requirements of renewing it? You renew, uh, it depends on the state. My Florida license, I renew every two years. My New York license, I renew every three years. And now, what are the requirements? You need 40 CPE credits every year. Now, don't make that scare you. 40 CPE credits is not like 40 college credits. 40 CPE credits is like one college course. One three credit college course is 45 CPE credits. So basically every year you do a college course. And there's a lot of CP that is offered here. You, once you become a CP, you, want, you might do more than that. Some years I do 200 CP courses. Mm -hmm. Because I want to be technical in these other areas, right? And I will go and get specialized knowledge in that area. Most of what I am doing in practice, I did not learn in the formal setting in school. I learned it after I graduate because the thing about college is this, you have to pay to learn to get a certain amount of education. When you become a professional, guess what? You are being paid to learn. Now, if I'm learning something, guess what? One of my clients have that issue. They are paying me a fee. I'm learning it and I'm taking care of their stuff. So when you become a professional, most of your learning will be paid for either by your client or by your employer. Right? But now you have to pay to learn until you get a certain level of competence. Once you reach that level of competence, somebody else will be paying for you to learn. Now I'm not learning something unless some client is paying for it, right? Mm -hmm. Or the school is paying for it. So you want to get to that stage where somebody else is paying for your education. Definitely. Thank you. Um, professor, I also have a question. Go ahead. <clears throat> So um, currently I'm studying and working in New York, but I live in New Jersey. So if I am thinking of applying for a CPA exam, um, I mean like New York State, do I have to take license for both? How, how does that work? Okay. Because as you mentioned, you have Florida license, you have New York license. So I'm just curious to understand. Once you're licensed in one state, mm -hmm. okay, the only thing you have to meet for any other state is their educational requirement. So if you license, let's say in New Jersey, and you want to be licensed in New York, you have to meet new, also New York educational requirement. If you have a master's degree and a bachelor's, a master's in accounting and a bachelor's, you meet the licensing requirements for any state you want to go. Gotcha. Now, when I moved to Florida, I had my master's and I was licensed in New York. So I just filed for licenses in Florida and I sent in all my education requirements. The only thing I had to do is take a test. And it's not a test like a CPA exam. They send you a booklet, you, you read what it's called, you take a law and rules test. You read the law and rules booklet and you answer the questions at the back. That's what the test is. It's an open book test. And I got my CPA in Florida. <clears throat> However, it's a little expensive being a CPA of two states. You just have to maintain my license in Florida and I have to pay my registration fees annually in Florida and I have to do the same in New York. But yeah, can you, you have a New York license and like work in other states? No. You, you could, license you could temporary. Okay. Let's say, you, let's say you have a New York license and you want to open a CPA practice in Florida. Eventually, you're going to have to meet Florida requirements. Now, 
If you're living in New Jersey and you want to open a CPA practice in New York, I think New York and New Jersey have a special agreement. So you don't have to be licensed in New York or in, you could be licensed in either of those states. I'm not 100% sure if that's still there, but I think they do have some agreement whereby if you're New Jersey licensed, you could practice in New York. Hmm. But these laws are governed by the different states. Thank you. Now, any other questions? Back to the requirements for a CP. The educational requirements, normally an undergraduate degree with a major in accounting include a minimum number of accounting credits. Most states now require 150 credits hours or 225 quarterly hours for license as a CPA. Some states require fewer credits before taking the exam, but require 150 semester credits before receiving the CPA certificate. In the state, there's a lot of state require a master's also, or the equivalent of a master's. The exam have four parts, auditing and attestation, financial accounting and reporting, regulation, business environment and concept. The experience varies widely from no experience to two years, depending on the state. So any state you want to be licensed in, you have to check with that state requirement. I think that's about conclude what we want to talk about today and conclude chapter one. Now your chapter one homework, you should do that and post it by next Tuesday, okay? In the discussion board? On the discussion board, that's right. Okay. okay. The homework at the back of the text, of the back of the chapter, you'll do that and post it on the discussion board on Tuesday. On Tuesday, I will come on and we will see if there's any questions to be addressed and so on, and I'll do that. But our main lecture will be on Thursday. If you miss Tuesday, it's no problem, but don't miss Thursday, okay? Gotcha. Thursday is where the meat and crux of everything is gonna be done. All right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I have a question for you. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Which states would you say is like, very beneficial. Like I, I checked online and um, I know it's California, DC, North Carolina, Florida. And when, when, you, when you say which is very beneficial, that's very subjective, depending yeah. on how you look at that. Some people say the state is beneficial because you need the least requirement to become a CPA. Mm, right. Okay. Like, I don't know currently, but I know back in the 80s and 90s, Maryland, you just need to take the exam and they give you a CPA license. But the CPA license they give you is not a license to practice. If you want to practice, you have to get the experience. Yes. I would advise CPA candidates, okay? You may not see the benefit of this now, but get your bachelor's, do your master's, and get licensed, meet the requirement that you could be licensed in a variety of states because you don't know, don't look for the minimum requirements, look for the maximum requirement, because you don't know when an opportunity will strike you and what state is coming from. And you want to be equipped to handle that. You don't want after you've been out of school for 20 years to have to go back to school. I see that happen with some people, right? You okay. don't want that to happen. I, You're young, I, set yourself up, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that I, uh, that happened to me I, I'm from I'm from Nepal. I did my completed my bachelor's in Nepal like way 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 back, and uh, moved to New York um, six years. No, it's been seven eight years, I guess. Um, and literally got interested um, in accounting, um, explored, and I am working in accounting sector, um, and came back to college again. And it's not, it's not a nice experience, is it? It's not the nicest experience, right. uh, but, uh, but I am enjoying the experience right now because I also have the knowledge of working professionally in the accounting field. And then, hmm. um, and then also like while um, studying, um, uh, I mean, it has, I, I would definitely say that it has, though even though late, it has opened up like a wide array of uh, opportunities and um, 
things to explore for me. So I'm do, grateful. For do that. you do you have kids? Yes, I do. So it doesn't it like kind of like because I know I did my wife and I both did a lot of schooling while we have kids, and you know it takes away a little time. Regardless of how you look at it, it takes away a little time. I'm sure you would have preferred finish all this when you were younger before you have kids. Thank you. Yes, I would. Uh, I definitely, I uh, think I um, would have done so. Yeah, the, the one thing that I regret is not completing my master's when I was there. Because after completing my bachelor's um, there, I did not, I did one year of master's, but then I left my studies. So that's my biggest regret. <laughs> and then, but now I, um, I think I'm doing it. But don't, don't worry, it's never too late to get things done. Yep. Okay? It's never right. too late. I'm glad you're, you're, you're back on track and you're doing it and you're enjoying it. And, um, you know, I thank you for sharing your experience with, the, with some of the younger students in the class. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I have, a, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, where do you practice under? Are you in auditing or public? When I was doing when I was doing um, consulting, SEC consulting, I was basically mm -hmm. in auditing because every public company had to file a financial statement for the SEC. So my practice then a lot of it was in auditing, and my lectures at the State Society was based on SEC accounting and SEC auditing. This was back okay. in about 90 to 2002. When I moved to Florida in 2003, um, I was commuting back and forth. My wife was teaching in the middle school. She got a job here for a year. And we started a real estate business. So we need somebody to run the business. So she had to retire from her job and run the real estate business for a few years. So we did that from 2003 to about uh, 2000, maybe about 2006, seven, when the economy started turning the other way. So we took a big hit. Mm. I still have my practice in New York, but to a limited extent because I give up all my SEC clients. And um, then we acquire a firm here in Florida. And in 2008, we acquire a firm. And the firm is basically, we are, we're not doing any audits. We're doing limited financials. We're doing mainly tax returns, accounting and bookkeeping services. So since then I got my wife and my kids, they all work here. We got two other CPAs that work here. I'm here to a limited extent at the firm. Uh, they, they run everything. Okay. And, um, nice. So yes, I, I, um, I do practice more in taxation now. I, I do IRS representation. Um, I do some financial statement prep, but I had a wealth of experience on both sides. Of, I'm kind of more of a generalist in, in accounting. Nice, nice. Now, it, I wanted to know: Is it harder to to uh, to get clients if you have your own like personal practice, or? But my practice in New York, when I started that, I um, I built it from scratch, hmm. and. To be honest with you, it was a lot of work because you have to learn marketing. You have to learn how to relate with people. You have to learn how to network. So you have to model yourself to be able to develop clients. So I, I read up on what it takes and I model myself to develop clients. And I enjoy doing it. I, okay. look, I enjoy sitting down with people. Like I teach, I enjoy teaching. It is my passion. Why? Because I think, I think I'm equipping Every semester, maybe 50 to 100 students to go out there and make a career for themselves. Right. You know, GE had this commercial, we bring good things to life. I tell my wife, you know, we make a difference in your life. Anybody who mm -hmm. comes in touch with us, whether you're my student, whether you're in my practice, whether you're know socially, we make a difference in people's lives. My client come to me and I take care of the accounting and I, I put them in situation where they will succeed. I, we always try to put people in situations where they will succeed. Yes. Yeah. If you just meet me on the street and talk, and talk to me for just one hour, I will make a difference in your life. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
I, that's the way I like to view myself. When I'm doing SEC practice, when I'm talking to the SEC in the days of the 90s, or I'm lecturing to the state society where we are lecturing to 450 accountants so far from the big four, that was a big eight CPA firm. I want to make a difference in people's life, a very positive difference. And that's all that's about me and what I want to do. And that's my mission in life. Yours don't have to be the same. Yours can be different. But every one of my students, I give them, I advise them like I'll advise my own kids what to do. Now, like my own kids, you're not going to take all of my advice, right? You're going to take some. But right. whatever you take, you want it to be a positive contribution to what you're doing. Correct. Now, remember this. Newton have a law in physics. He said every action carry a reaction that equal and opposite. Correct. That doesn't apply to physics alone. That applies to everything that we do in life. If I meet you in the street, or let's say I meet you at your college in, in the corridor back in the days when before COVID, your reaction to me will be based on my reaction to you. If I look at you and smile, you probably look back at me and smile or say hello, right? If I look at you in front, you're like, what the hell wrong with him, right? <laughs> so we could, bring out, we could bring out good reactions from people on a daily basis, or we could bring out bad reactions from people on a daily basis. So I try to model myself that I want to bring a good reaction. Now, not every day I'm able to do that. Not every day I'm on cue. Sometimes you are so engulfing your thought that you don't see somebody pass next to you. But generally, that's the way I like to look at myself. And that's the way I like to model myself. Whether I'm in the classroom, whether I'm online, whether I'm in my practice, or whether I'm just having a drink with my friends. Right? It must be something positive that I'm bringing out to the other people. Correct. Understand. I hope that when this COVID finished, that we could be back on campus and I could see some of you guys in person and you could come to my office for advice and we could chat and we could talk about your career and try to put you in the right direction. But unfortunately, given the situation of what's going on, you guys are there. I'm here. You're in the snow. I'm in the sun. So <laughs> let's make the best of it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Any other, any other questions? All right. You guys have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. Enjoy Super Bowl. Stay warm. I'll talk to some of you on Tuesday, but hopefully I'll talk to all of you on Thursday when we lecture on Chapter 2. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.